Good evening, everyone. I'm going to ask people to take their seats. We'll get started. This is Nancy, and this is my name, Nancy Paul Shaw. I'm out of my head. 
Welcome, welcome. It's good to see you this evening. My name is Adam Rubin. I'm the senior rabbi here at Beth Jacob and a fellow morning prayer goer with our author. <laughs> uh, we are true partners in the enterprise, but I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, I am in a moment going to introduce uh, Susan, our author, um, and I do want to just acknowledge uh, that, um, that uh, Francis Fisher, who's our, uh, our communications and programming person here at the synagogue, uh, was really, really helped a lot in organizing things and definitely would have been here, uh, but alas, her, um, her dear mother just passed away today, so she's in Los Angeles uh, and was not able to be here with us. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, but that aside, this is a really joyful event uh, because Susan has, and I'll refine this, but has given birth, so to speak, uh, or at least sent to kindergarten, uh, a, a book that, um, that looks to be a wonderful read, according to the blurb that, uh, that I read and that she, uh, she posted. Uh, it sounds like an absolute page turner. I have to tell you that I've now known Susan, and we've really worked together in a real way, uh, dealing with the Morning Mini now for, um, for almost my entire stay here in Minnesota since my family and I arrived uh, about 17 months ago. And we've, you know, we've emailed a lot, we've schmoozed a lot, I've gotten to know her, and I have to acknowledge, Susan, that truly I didn't realize that you were an author, a published author, uh, until not too long ago. I mean, I think in part it was my own just my head in the clouds a little bit, didn't really know, um, and was delighted to discover the fact that this is, uh, this is who you are. And then it all, came, it all came together for me. It made sense as I thought about it because the fact is that you are a deeply insightful person, uh, hilariously funny and sharp, and somewhat at times a little snarky, let's face it. <laughs> you never. Uh, but, in, but very, very observant, very observant. That is, a, really has a, a real sense, you have a great sense of people and what's going on underneath. And I know this because we've had to figure out and deal with different issues in our morning minion, our, our morning prayer group. And, uh, and so it's, it sort of made sense to me, ah, it, you know, she's a writer, it, uh, it works. Now, um, I myself was, I'm a recovering academic, and while I always, what I would, while I would have loved to be a, a writer of fiction, and uh, sort of fantasized about that, um, the fact is I published works of uh, nonfiction, but not of, uh, of, of, of narrative prose, or certainly of poetry. But uh, I remember reading an account by the great Bengali-American writer Jhumpa Lahiri. Uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful writer of fiction who grew up in Massachusetts, but her parents are from Bangladesh, uh, or from the Bengali part of India, and uh, she won a Pulitzer Prize. She's a very, very fine writer. And I remember listening to an interview with her uh, by Terry Gross on Fresh Air, and she was talking about the process of writing, and she went on and on, about what a torment it was, how difficult, how it, it was like pulling teeth that she could barely conceive of getting a page written. And this is a woman who has won a Pulitzer Prize and published a number of books, both novels and short stories. Um, Ernest Hemingway famously said that writing isn't hard, you just sit at a typewriter and bleed. Um, now, uh, well, thank God, uh, I imagine Susan has not bled. Uh, she wrote a really interesting, she directed me to it, a really interesting uh, piece on her website which described the process of producing uh, this book. And, and she notes that, in fact, it's not like giving birth, and you don't say this, but it's certainly not like bleeding. But, uh, Susan writes, publishing a novel is, in fact, like sending your kid to kindergarten. You spend months talking about it. You spend weeks gathering up supplies and the proper outfits. You spend days agonizing over whether you're being a helicopter parent or a normal concerned parent. You make yourself crazy second guessing this kid's entry into academia, all the while aggravating over whether or not everyone's gonna like your kid. The day comes and you spend it waiting to hear how it went. If the kid actually decides to tell you, sometimes they don't. 
Well, that's publishing. You send off the manuscript to the pros and hope they don't throw it back at you with the pfft. You get the notes, make the changes, take a machete to it, I know I do, and send it back. There's a bunch of back and forth that makes a writer freaking nuts, even though you know it's all necessary. Eventually, someone tells you the file you're downloading is the final draft, and you're ready to go. The book goes to first grade, second grade, and if you're lucky, it makes it all the way through. And I know we're all delighted that this novel, The Pomegranate, has made it all the way through. I can't wait to hear you read from it. And we're all anticipating your words. Uh, and we welcome you here uh, as, a, um, as an author, as an honored member of this congregation, and as the delightfully insightful, loving, and yes, sometimes snarky person you are, Susan Siegfried. Hi, first I want to thank everybody for coming. I worried nobody would be here, seriously. But I, I that's because I'm short. <laughs> the, before I get started with this, I do have to give a shout out to Morgan. Morgan, raise your hand. Morgan read the book when it was just called Batsheva years ago and sent me pages and pages and pages of notes where I was right, where I was wrong, where she saw opportunity. <laughs> that became my guide for writing this book. Without Morgan's notes sitting next to me on the desk, and they are still there, <laughs> this book would not exist. The truth of the matter is it's really hard to come up here and talk about people I know as intimately as I know the people in that book. These are my peeps. I've been living with them for almost two decades. Stephen was alive when I started this. He, he, read, he read bits and pieces of it, thought I had lost my mind. Um, and some and friends and family who are here will know that there comes a time when I'm writing when you can't have a conversation with me unless it includes characters and in the old days, diapers. Um, but this is the plight of many storytellers. We become obsessed with our work, but I think everybody in this room kind of knows that already, not just from me, but from the number of artists in this congregation and in our lives. Every story has a kernel of truth to it, and this one does too. Buried inside the pomegranate is a little tiny piece of truth. And that is, there was a girl who left the south of Spain, Al Andalus, crossed the Mediterranean on her way to her wedding, and was snatched out of her caravan. She disappeared. Nobody knew what happened to her. Many years later, she returned to Al Andalus with some of her children. One of her great, 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 great granddaughters happened to have been a friend of mine in high school. And that was where I first heard the story. And I think I drove her mother crazy asking questions. And her mother would say things like, sweetheart, we don't know. We don't know what happened to her. There were two things that we did know, though. One was that she wrote. And they have two or three lines of poetry that survived. And the only indication we have about her life is the guy to whom she was given was the love of her life. Beyond that, nothing. I was so captivated by that little tiny bit of story that it kept coming up in my brain over and over and over. Her name, by the way, was not Batsheva. That was my grandmother's name. My grandma Batsheva, known as Grandma Bessie, AKA Grandma Don't, and the book is dedicated to her. Um, actually, my grandpa Ben, her husband's 85th year at site was today. So this is really kind of you know, fitting. But um, she, she survived in the face of tragedy. Life threw her a rotten hand, and she decided she wasn't just gonna live, she was gonna survive and survive well, and she did. And that steel spine, that determination is what I tried to give Batsheva. Um, 
Her story is not Batsheva's story, obviously, but I think that they share that same fortitude. But let me introduce you to Batsheva Hagiz. She is a woman of her time who finds herself at the center of war and politics. That was never her intention. She only wanted to be Akiva's wife, mother of his children, wife merchant for the house of Hagiz and Vital in whatever city they ended up in. Her dreams were the dreams of any Jewish girl of Al-Andalus, family, laughter, children, and learning. The women of merchant families, if you've never read anything about the period, the Muslim women were, were isolated. They were in Seraglio, they were in Harem, they were in you know, Sarai. So they couldn't go out to the markets, the rich women anyway, the ones that had the money. So what the merchant wives would do was that they would go into the, into the, to the mansions and the palaces and sell their wares to the women behind the veil. And that was what Batsheva was expected to do. She was expected to be that woman going behind the curtain to sell to the wives of, of the local caliphate and you know the rich guys. And she was trained for that. She was trained in math, in language, how to keep sales records, how to keep books. She was expected to be a partner. Additionally, she learned, she was expected to speak multiple languages, which was pretty standard for the time. They, at home, they spoke, spoke something that resembles Judeo-Arabic, which is almost gone now completely. That eventually would sort of become, you know, Castellano Hebrew and would somehow flow into what we now call Ladino. But in those days, it was really Judeo-Arabic. She was also expected to speak classical Arabic, Castilian, French, some Greek, and some Latin in order to communicate with whatever customer came through the door. Someone had to do it. Oh, so let me begin with the start of Basheva's story. Um, it begins in a market square in Malaga, where Batsheva is visiting the stall of a fabric merchant. She's eight years old. Ma ismik yafata. A hand was touching her market basket. Turning her eyes upward, she glanced at the boy with disdain, said nothing, and went on examining the bolts of fabric on the merchant's table as if he was nothing more than an annoying fly. I asked your name and I would have you answer me. His voice tightened as he tightened his grip on her basket. The girl turned again, this time her eyes bore into his, and he saw that they were as gray as winter storm clouds. The way they met his, unwavering and direct, deepened his resolve to know who she was. You will answer when I speak to you, he insisted, drawing himself up to his full height. Do you not know who I am? Unhand my sister! Another boy, smaller than the first but wiry, ready to defend his sister's honor, pushed his way forward. This boy grabbed the offending arm and jerked it with such force that the offender landed clumsily on the ground. Leaping up, he charged the smaller boy, ready to dispatch him into the dust. Arms entangled, arms, legs flew, and a crowd of onlookers gathered to shout encouragement to the combatants. The girl dove into the fray, using her body as a fulcrum to add leverage to her brother's defense until all three tumbled into the dust. The brother, given the advantage by his sister's attack, twisted around until his opponent was pinned to the ground. You leave my sister alone, he shouted, waving a fist in the offender's face. I did nothing to your sister. You talk to my sister, and that is not permitted, he countered, digging a knee into the rasping chest. You are a dirty boy, pronounced the girl now standing above them, her own dress dusty, her headdress askew, tendrils of burnished copper hair falling onto her face, her hands planted defiantly on her non-existent hips. I do not talk to dirty boys. <laughs> Yehuda, release him! A richly dressed man broke through the crowd and hauled the boy off his victim's chest. I cannot leave you two for a moment without one of you causing one ruckus or another. The tall boy sprang to his feet. Your boy has no manners, he spat. He should be beaten until he learns some. He tugged on his dusty thobe in an effort to regain his dignity. His own father would most likely take him to task for returning in this condition, but there was nothing he could do about it now. His father was striding towards him, dark eyes flashing with anger. 
What is this about? asked the second father when he reached his son. This boy says I insulted his sister by speaking to her. I merely asked her name. Is this a crime in Malaga, he demanded. One does not address unfamiliar women on the street. He looked about for the object of his son's attentions, but saw no woman, only a girl of no more than eight years old, her dress soiled, her headdress listing at a precarious angle. Is that her? Leaning close to his father's ear, the boy whispered, buy her for me, father. I'm old enough to have a female slave of my own. His father's laughter rang through the square. One does not buy a female who catches one's fancy, much less a child. He saw the redness of shame staining his son's smooth cheeks and chose to ignore it as he turned to the boy who had bested his son and his august-looking father. Forgive my son, sir, he is young and untested. His actions were merely unwise, not meant to insult. The other father nodded with understanding. No offense has been taken, my lord, Sheikh Mahmoud. Let us both instruct our children in the proper way to behave in public. With knowing nods and suppressed smiles, the fathers removed their children from the center of attention and the crowd dispersed. So we already know she's tough stuff, right? <laughs> this, this, as a kid, this, this is tough stuff. About six years later, we find Batsheva in her mother's garden. In some ways, she's not too much different from the eight-year-old. She's stubborn and wants to learn what she wants to learn. Egged on by her father, she does not learn. She, she learns math and astronomy, cartography, and sword play. She knows how to run a household, but she also knows how to keep the books. She knows she will be called on to visit a seraglio. But now, as she gets ready to leave the safety of her parents' house, she worries that she maybe doesn't know everything quite yet. She's about 14, which is reaching the end of marriageable age in that period. She's sort of long in the tooth. Most of her friends are already married by then. But she was holding out. And you'll learn about holding out in the book. I'm not telling you that part. But Sheva found her mother sitting in her beneath her favorite pomegranate tree in the corner of the inner courtyard, her fingers deftly separating strands of silk. Miriam Hagiz noticed, but did not comment on the pink flush of her daughter's face. Come sit with me, Batsheva, and tell me of your preparations. She patted the empty space on the bench. Batsheva took the proffered space and immediately relieved her mother of her needlework. I wish my stitches were as fine as yours. Perhaps if you spent as much time on your needlework as you did on your sword play, your cartography, they would be. The chide was gentle, but it was well aimed. Papa says if I am to travel by caravan from Tunis to Sfax, I must know where I am going and how to defend myself. I can now throw a dagger straight into a tree trunk every time. Asher says I have deadly aim. No harm will ever come to me. Her mother glanced from beneath lowered lashes as she threaded her needle and smiled. I am sure you are more than able to defend yourself, my little lioness. Your brothers have sported the results of your defenses more than once, I'm afraid. They spend too much time with their noses in holy books. Even the rabbi says so. Bacheva's lower lip inched forward into a pout, but retracted quickly. The preparations are going well, and I will be ready to sail at month's end. The girl sighed and sagged. I am very anxious to go, Mama, but I am worried. But you will be amongst family, both Papa's and mine, Batsheva. They will all be at the wedding, and you know your cousins. I haven't seen them since we were children. Will they be able to teach me what I need to know about visiting those Sarai for Akiva? Will there anyone there be my age, or will I be the youngest? What about... And, 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 Miriam Hagiz laughed and laughed again, taking her daughter's hands. Just like a pomegranate, you are full of seeds of knowledge. You already know what to do and how to do it. All those hours spent at the table learning from your father will not be wasted. You will be fine, Granadita. You will have a lovely home for as long as you are there. And when the time comes, Akiva will bring you home to us. Perhaps, God willing, with several grandchildren to dandle on my knee, 
Batsheva blushed to the roots of her copper hair. She's a bit on the innocent side. She kind of knows how babies are made, but nobody's really talked to her about it. The research began in earnest at this point, when I st at this point in the story. This is kind of where I stopped for a while. Not only was I looking at caravan routes for her travel to Sfax, I began searching out locales and populations for the trip. This was kind of arduous. I had no idea when I began this that tribalism was as bloody as it was in Al-Andalus and the Maghreb, the Maghreb being the north of Africa. I spent weeks figuring out not just who they hated, but what they wore to do it. Clothing is really, really important, and getting the clothing right was a big deal. Um, by the time photography happens, and because and, you always see pictures from like the 19th century, you know, the, you know, the mid to late 19th century, not even close to what they were wearing at the end of the 12th century. But you can extrapolate certain things. You know that the men wore dresses. You know, what we would call dresses. They wore robes. They did not wear trousers unless they were in battle. Stuff like that. But the research was enormous, and the further I dug into it, the worse it got. If anybody could go look at my Mac at home and open up the bookmarks folder and go to the little tiny folder that looks innocuous enough that says Batsheva Research, there were probably 100 bookmarks in there, each one denoting clothing, food, and behaviors. And it just gets worse. The deeper I get into the story, the more I need to know, the more time I'm spending tracking this stuff down. In the course of tracking it down, I'm looking for maps. I had this thing in my head that maybe I would have a map in the beginning of the book. But finding a map from the 11th century was really hard. The 12th century, less hard. The 13th, 14th, 15th, no sweat. But the 11th century was tough. And then I found a map of trade routes in the Mediterranean from the mid to late 11th century and 12th century and the progression. And this map, which was green and black, sort of shaded, kept showing up again and again and again. Every time somebody was teaching a course on medieval history, there was the map. And I figured, this is a really good map. I would love to use it, even though it's not an old-fashioned looking map. I'd really love to use it in the book because it's very exact. And I began looking for the cartographer. No one ever credited this poor guy. It was the same map over and over and over. Then USC, of all places, had a little note saying that the map had been developed by a fellow named Martin Jan Manson, nothing else. And I began, I took a break and I began looking for Martin Jan Manson. Took a bit of research and I found him in Sweden. The guy is a city planner, <laughs> but this is his hobby and he does all these ethno studies with maps and things. Anyway, I found an email address for Martin and I wrote to him and I said, hi, I'd like to arrange to use your map in the front of my book. And I told him a little bit about the book. Martin went gaga on me. He got so excited. And he, I, said, I said to him, I would like to know what your rate is because I want to pay for this because I, you know, there's got to be a copyright involved. He says, no, no, free, please use it. And then we went back and forth a few times. I had some questions. And he comes back to me one day and he says, would you like me to make this Batsheva's map? Aww. So the map you see in the beginning of the book, and you do need a magnifying glass because it's small, but the map is the map he created based on Batsheva's route through the Mediterranean and all the way around. And he's, he's absolutely wonderful. I'm madly in love with him. He's cute as can be. And... Um, in the course of this, Cambridge University just reached out to him to ask him to partner on a project for medieval history. And he's just totally over the moon at the moment. And as we speak, there is a copy of the book en route to Sweden. But this guy is just super. I just, I, I think the world of him, and he's funny as all get out. Um, Martin is my hero. 
He's just been so excited through this whole process. It's been just so much fun. I, this was like a little sidebar, but it ended up being hugely fun to work with him on it. So back to Batsheva. So she's on this caravan, she gets snatched, and she finds herself given as a gift to a tribal leader, a sheikh of a small band. We're not talking, you know, big band here, we're talking small band, 200. Uh, I won't go into the details of how and when, because that would be a spoiler, but she makes the decision to survive. Since no one ever talks to her, she never answers anybody. They think she's mute until one night. But Sheva lay on her side, the weight of Khalil's arm more than a little uncomfortable. She could not move without disturbing him, and in a moment of compassion, she wished him peace after so difficult a night. Lying there, she listened for his steady breathing, hoping she could fall asleep. But every time she closed her eyes, something unseen snapped them open. An unbidden picture of the market in Malaga came to mind, but it was not the cherished memory of walking with her mother, this time it was a hot summer day when a Moorish boy put his hand on her basket. Mais Mikyafata. The dark eyes of the boy were seared into her memory. What is your name, girl? In that moment, as she recalled the intensity of his stare, she understood those same eyes were closed beside her. But Sheva stared at the man. Oddly, everything about him made new sense. Instead of feeling some relief at putting a name to, um, to that strange memory from childhood, she suddenly felt endangered. But the danger was not from the man. It was coming from the pit of her stomach, something she could not name, but it was palpable. A tiny movement made the brazier's shadow on the wall flicker ever so slightly. Keeping still, she focused on the black shape at the flap of the tent until she was convinced someone had come in. Inching her right hand under Khalil's pillow, she felt for his dagger. Although his hand was on the hilt, she managed to slide it out far enough for her own hand to close over the top. The black-clad figure, almost invisible against the dark tent, moved stealthily along the wall. And for a moment, she hoped it might be one of the old crones coming to cleanse her, as they often did when Khalil went to bathe. But it was the glint of metal that told her otherwise. She tightened her grip on the dagger. The figure moved along the wall nearing the bed. Bacheva had no doubt the little flash was a blade. Counting the steps, she sucked in her breath and in a single fluid motion, rolled over, sat up, and hurled the dagger with deadly accuracy. A cry split the air. Khalil flew up with a shout. He landed on his feet, momentarily confused by his empty hand. His eyes widened when he saw the body, a weapon still clutched in the assassin's own hand, his own dagger protruding from the dead man's chest. Calmly, Batsheva walked over to the body and with her toe pushed the hood away from the face. Gamal, she said quietly as she bent to retrieve the dagger. You killed him. Khalil's eyes widened when he saw the dagger clutched in her hand. Will you use that on me now? Batsheva looked at him, then at the dagger. Do not be absurd, she replied smoothly in Arabic with a definite Al-Andalus accent. My life would not be worth a handful of sand if you were dead, nor would the life of your child. Khalil stared at her. You understand me, he sputtered. Why did you not tell me? Her jaw clenched, her eyes narrowed dangerously. You never asked. <laughs> she took a step toward him and let the dagger fall at his feet. Picking up his jalaba, she pulled it over her small body. I'm going to the well, she said, as she arranged the hood. I trust you will remove the camel dung before it fouls our, our tent. When she was gone, a slow grin split Khalil's troubled face. She may have won this battle, but he felt as though he had just won the war. She goes to the well, she comes back, she goes through a phalanx of men who were standing there waiting to move the body. I brought water, you should wash, she said quietly. 
It was not necessary I can go to the well. His voice was almost apologetic. But Sheva ignored him as she poured water into a large laver. Whatever you wish, she replied airily. But you should know, I do not speak to dirty boys. Silence stripped between them. She dared not look at Khalil, but she could feel his eyes boring a hole into her back. When he grabbed her arm to turn her to him, the jug tumbled and water soaked the ground at their feet. Batsheva jerked her arm free and bent to retrieve the jug, but his command stopped her. Leave it! What did you say? Batsheva casually pushed back the hood of the jalaba and met his eyes straight on. I said, I do not speak to dirty boys. Not then, not now, not ever. Ma ismikia fata, he asked softly. Please tell me, what is your name? My name is of no importance, Khalil ibn Mahmud. Pick one which you like, and that is how I shall be known. This, is, this woman is tough stuff. Don't mess with her. Eventually, he does find out her name, but that's another spoiler. You're not getting it. Um, her skill with a sword. Okay. Sean Murphy once said to me, never leave a gun sitting on the mantelpiece. I have kept this close to my heart when I'm writing stories where weapons are involved. We talk about the dagger in the very, very beginning, but we don't, but it's not until she's lying there and she takes Gamal out that we realize that's, that was important stuff. As is the sword play, you know? It, it comes back to sword play and the fact that she is tough. I'm going to read you two little pieces. Um, but Sheva is not shy about the fact that she knows how to handle a weapon. They have now gone from the Maghreb. They have crossed over. They have been in Akko. And because Akko is about to fall, she is moved to the south to a group of Bedou, which, would, which is what we know as Bedouins now, but they used to be called the Bedou. And she is hiding out with them with the kids. But Sheva dozed on her pallet until the thunder of hoofbeats and shouts of alarm made her bolt upright. Grabbing her safe, she raced through the ten flap. A safe, by the way, is a sword. Grabbing her safe, she raced through the ten flap. A cloud of dust was bearing down on the encampment. She could not tell how many horsemen there were, but the thick, dull pounding that vibrated the ground beneath her feet told Batsheva these were not Arabs. These were heavily armored foreigners. Ishmael Haji shouted for her to flee, but there was not enough time to cinch the girth. Instead, as the foreigners charged into the encampment, Batsheva tightened her grip on her scimitar and ran towards where the men were prepared to defend themselves. They were no match for the riders. Outnumbered three to one, the Bedou fought bravely yet fell covered in the blood of their enemy. Batsheva fought beside Fayed, when the biggest horse she had ever seen mowed him down, only her agility and boy's clothing kept her from sharing his fate. Swinging the safe with all her might, she managed to cut into the leg of the rider. He screamed in pain and jerked the reins of his mount. The horse reared, pitching his rider into the dust. As the animal crashed to the ground atop the night, Batsheva leapt to the side, only to be caught in the path of another horse. I just lost my place. Oh, she fell and rolled away and then jumped up and charged the knight on horseback. Safe raised, a blood-curdling scream came out of her mouth as she swung, catching the knight mid-section. The knight, bleeding profusely, managed to swing his shield around as he fell, Batsheva, hitting Batsheva on the side of the head. The blow sent her reeling. Something else hit her just before the blackness swallowed her whole. The man who finds her face down under her own horse thinks he found a boy. He can't bring himself to leave a child in the dust, so he takes the kid and the horse with him as he leaves. When Batsheva finally comes to, because she's taken it pretty hard in the head, when she finally comes to and stays awake, she's on a ship bound for who knows where. She doesn't know. It's established in that scene that her captor, she, both she and her captor speak French, which is 
correct for the period. If it was an English knight at that time, French would have been, if not his first language, his second language, because all transaction and all business in England was carried on in French at that point. Once again, Batsheva is tough stuff. She gives away as little as possible. She realizes this guy has the power to send her home, at this point, preferably to Akko. And there were reasons for that, which are spoilers, I'm not telling you. She had seen blue eyes before, but none quite like his. He insisted she was not his prisoner, yet he refused to return her to Akko. He had carried her to his ship, yet he referred to her as a boy. Was he toying with her? Or did he honestly think she was a male? She smiled at the thought, no, he's not stupid. He was decidedly cagey. Sitting up a little straighter, she took another fig, then leaned forward to study the map. It was not the drawing of a place she recognized, although she had seen many foreign maps before this. The words were written in the same characters as French and Castilian, but the names seemed unpronounceable. Moving her lips, she tried to sound out one of the words. Yorkshire, said Durham, opening one eye. He pointed to an area not far to the north. And again, remember, he's speaking in French. Um, These are my lands. Are they near to York, she asked. Not too distant. Do you know York? No, she lied. But she would give him no more information than necessary. But I have heard the name before. Where are you from, he asked gently. Akko. He smiled slowly and shook his head. I think not, little girl. Batsheva choked on the fruit in her mouth. Durham was up in a flash to pound her back. Are you all right, he asked when the coughing subsided. She nodded, then frowned. Hardly a little girl, monsieur. A young woman, perhaps. A mother of twins, not a little girl. His laughter rang out. It was a rich sound which took her by surprise. A mother? You are hardly past your 12th birthday. Batsheva's laugh was harsh. Well past, monsieur. Her brief sardonic smile turned downward. But do not think I am an unschooled maid who will will allow you your freedom with her. I have killed with my sword and with a single throw of my dagger. Her eyes narrowed dangerously. I have tasted death. It does not frighten me. Durham sobered quickly. I would hope I give you no cause to kill me, my lady. I did naught but rescue you from the arms of death. You were the one who took me from the camp? She saw him nod. Was it your men who slaughtered my people? Again, he nodded. Then I should kill you. Does not your Bible say a life for a life? I want to talk about food for just a minute. Because as she's progressing through Europe, the subject of food, this is a Jewish woman. And the subject of food is really kind of serious for her. Until this point, she's been living with Muslims who don't eat pork. And they basically eat the same way Jews do. And as much as I try to find out about Shrita and Kashrut in the 11th, 12th, and 13th century, I could find nothing that told me very much about it. Um, But she is keenly aware of what she should and should not eat. Long ago, in in an earlier part of the book, she, she says she has the discussion with herself whether or not her situation calls for Kiddush Hashem, for suicide, rather than submit to what's happening to her. And she decides that she's not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Um, but food becomes sort of a through line as, as we progress with her. But at the same time, Batsheva keeps her Jewishness very, very close to the chest. She's not telling anybody anything, because Jews are just not safe wherever they are. And she knows this. She's well aware that you know there are ghettos, there's persecution, there are Christians out there that want us to be something else. And so she's just not willing to say, oh, hello, I'm Jewish. So She does what she does sort of on the sly. Batsheva stared at the oddly colored meat. Until now, she had managed to eat mostly cheese and bread when they traveled, occasionally allowing herself a piece of recognizable poultry. Is there no bread? 
she whispered. Apparently not, replied Durham, popping a piece of meat into his mouth. You'd better eat this, for this is all they will provide. Cautiously, Batsheva tore a small piece with her fingers and tasted it. The flavor was foreign and had the distinct taste of rancid fat. What manner of beef is this, she asked, forcing herself to swallow. This is not beef, my boy. This is good English ham. He cut himself a, another larger slice. Ham? She repeated the English word. Qu'est-ce que c'est ham? He laughed heartily. Jambon! Batsheva turned white and began to choke. Durham turned to slap her back, but she was already up from the table and halfway to the door. He ran after her in time to see her retching in the yard. He held her head as she emptied the meager contents of her stomach. Are you all right? He asks that a lot. Um, he asked when she finally stopped. You fed me pig meat, barbarian. How could you do such a thing? No civilized person eats swine. Tis an unclean animal. I shall surely die. She retched again. Durham stared at her in disbelief. I'm, I'm sorry, I did not know. Barbarian. No wonder these people look the way they do. They eat pig meat. Tossing her head, she marched toward the stable. I happen, that happens to be one of my, nobody's laughing, but that was one of my favorite scenes when I wrote it. When she calls her, she's a barbarian. <laughs> at this point, she's getting comfortable. Um, I have to admit, once they get to England, I took the greatest liberty with history. And I will say, and I say it in the beginning of the book, um, in the acknowledgments, Durham, the city of Durham was not an earldom. The city of Durham was a bishopric meaning that they didn't have like an earl or a duke or a, you know, somebody running them. The bishop who lived in the cathedral ran the show. But I needed Durham to be where Durham was. York was fine, York had an earl, that was great. That's his sister, his sister's husband. But I needed him to be an earl and I needed him to be halfway to Scotland. So I checked with a dear friend of mine who's British, who lives here, and I said, how pissed off will people be if I make Earl, you know, Durham an earldom? And Colin laughed and he goes, they won't notice. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody remembers that far back except you. So, um, but I did find one really interesting thing that I, I just loved. Um, I needed an intervention by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And like everything else in the book, I needed the name of the Archbishop of Canterbury for the year that I wanted to use. There was no Archbishop of Canterbury. He was dead. He was appointed. He died. And they didn't have anybody to take over right away. So the job went to this poor guy, <laughs> this poor Schlemiel named Herbert Poor. And he served as archdeacon until a new archbishop could be named. They must have gone through four or five attempts to name an archbishop. And this poor guy, his name was a perfect Herbert Poor, who was stuck with a job he didn't want, didn't, couldn't do, and everybody hated him for it. it was, that was one of the best pieces of history. Um, I'm going to stop there because the rest really gets interesting and I'm not going there. Um, <laughs> I will tell you that Eleanor of Aquitaine plays a major part in the back end of the book. Eleanor is a personal hero of mine. I feel like I know her intimately. <laughs> um, but she is an incredible, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who's really Queen Eleanor of England, um, was married first to a French king and divorced him because she didn't, I, they said she didn't reproduce, but this guy sounded like he, wasn't, he was the one who wasn't reproducing because when she married Henry II, who was masterfully played by Peter O'Toole in A Lion in Winter, and Eleanor was played by um, Catherine Hepburn. They had, a, they had a passel of children. They had a very interesting marriage. Towards the end, they hated each other. But he died. Richard the, Richard the Lionheart becomes king. This is also the same time as Prince John and Sherwood Forest and Robin Hood. Okay, But Richard becomes king. He marries Berengaria goes off to the Crusades, he's probably gay, she has no interest in sleeping with him, they never reproduce, 
And they leave Eleanor running the country. And Eleanor has a series of justicars, and those are her assistants. But she hauls the Privy Council from town to town, and she runs that place like us, like a well-oiled clock. Everybody does what Eleanor wants. She is, and plus she writes books. She, wrote, she really wrote the first text on courtly love. She was a huge power in her own right. It is only fitting that if Bacheva is in England with an earl, because Durham is an earl, um, that she has contact with Eleanor. And Eleanor is really, in so many ways, I find Eleanor to be a role model for modern women in general. I mean, she was tough stuff. I love that woman. OK, that's all I'm going to tell you about the book. Questions? Nobody has any questions? Oh, do we have? Oh, if you're on live stream, by the way, you can chat a question, I guess. And if Misha Siegfried is listening, there are no zombies in this book, nor will there ever be any zombies in this book. That is, that's actually not Misha's question. What was, oh, Misha? <laughs> Misha has a question. Uh, in your interview with TCG Folk, you said that the genre of choice was strong women. Wait, I, take your mask down. I can't understand you. In your interview with TCG Folk, you said that your genre of choice was strong women. What is your definition of a strong woman in literature? That's a really good question from my son. Um, <laughs> Much better than, than the zombie one he asked me before I came. Um, a strong woman is a woman, it, it, whether it's in literature or in real life, I view strong women are the ones who face adversity and don't let it, you know, pound them into the ground. Strong women, it, it doesn't have to be strong like Batsheva changing the world. Strong women are Maxine who lost a husband very young and raised a daughter and made a life, all right? That's a strong woman, all right? There are all sorts of women who are beset with horrible situations, and they don't, they, they may curl up for a little while, but they don't stay curled up. They get up, they dust themselves off, and they go on. My grandmother, my grandma Bessie, was a really good example from, of that. My grandfather died 85 years ago, leaving her with three kids one of whom wasn't even bar mitzvahed yet. My mom was 14. He was in a partnership with his brother in a butcher store. And when grandpa died, um, his brother told my, my grandmother that there was never an agreement that he was a partner in the store. And he basically left them to starve. This was in Borough Park. And my grandmother wasn't taking that answer. And she. When, as soon as she could get up from Shiva and Shloshim, she hauled her butt down to the Lower East Side to Delancey Street and started haranguing people until they gave her credit. She opened up a ladies' foundation and linens shop in her dining room. And that's how she fed her family. And she never wanted a store because that would have cost money to run. But she had a very steady clientele. And once the kids were OK and on their own and out of the house, she went to work as a tailor in, a, in May's department store in Brooklyn. But she survived very well, because she wasn't going to let them crush her. And as other of her friends lost their spouses, they would haul out Bessie to go get them you know, out of the gutter. And my grandmother would schlep them down to Delancey, you know, and get them credit and get other people set up and shop. Yet a Cohen opened a framing store that lasted until the mid '80s, because she went, it was because my grandmother said we gotta find something nobody else does, and that's what they did. They did framing. That's a strong woman. All right, you don't have to change the world. You can feed your family and be an incredibly strong woman. When I write the, the women that I write about, um, the two, my other two books are on the back table. In Lingua Galactica, that was a book I, you know, Stephen dared me to write it, so I did. Um, the protagonist is the daughter of, two, of, an, of, a, of a general and an admiral. And she chooses not to use her last name because she doesn't want to be she doesn't want to ride their coattails. She wants to make her own way. She's a very, very strong woman. And by the way, she'll just pop you if you get in her way. So never, never tangle with that girl. Um, in Dream Dancer, 
Leah Fine is an anthropologist. She is a, she is a trained observer. She is not an actor. Her job is to observe and to record, yet she's strong enough so that people respect that ability to observe and then report on what she sees. She's not there to change the world. She's just there to observe and, and in a sense, record what she sees so that others can see it. She is very strong in her own way, but she's not, not like, Leif, not like um, Sarah Jane, and she's certainly not like Batsheva. But it's OK. She's got her own strength. Um, strong women in literature, you know, you want to go back to Austin, we can talk about that for a while. You know, Elizabeth Bennett, one of the strongest women ever written. You know, don't mess with them. It doesn't have to be a grand gesture. It can be very, very small. But if you get up out of the dung heap and you fix what's around you, that makes you a strong woman. Any other questions? Or was Misha the only person asking? <laughs> Is there any other questions here in the audience? Oh, come on. I didn't explain everything that well. <laughs> we do have another comment from the live stream. Uh, this is from Sloan. Uh, they say, I love this book and Batsheva as a role model of a woman with a strong masculine side and a strong feminine side. Will there be a sequel to The Pomegranate? I don't do sequels. <laughs> um, the next book is actually about an arts lawyer and um, her relationship with an orthopedist. Um, <laughs> it's an odd pairing, I know, but these are really interesting people. My characters, my characters sit on my shoulder sort of and say, have I got a story for you? And that's where they come from. And they hack me a chinik until I begin to write their stories. And it's fun. I love these people. They become very real to me. Um, it's, uh, Stephen, Stephen used to say it was slightly schizophrenic. But it was OK. I was funny. So how are we on time? You're doing great. OK. But the characters, the, the characters, I will write something. The, the, the true story, I will be driving down the highway, you know, singing, reeling in the ears or whatever, and somebody will whisper in my ear, I didn't say that. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, come on, guys, don't do this to me while I'm driving. And somebody will say, no, and it happens. I mean, I will be cooking dinner, and somebody will whisper in my ear, mm-mm wrong and I will go back and I will look at whatever it is my you know schizoid brain is telling me doesn't work I will go back and look at it and say where did I go wrong with this and I, and I will obviously work with the character but the character really come the character develops and I don't think there is an author out there that doesn't have that little voice in their ear when they're writing unless they're James Michener and they have 90 assistants who actually do the writing for them in which case he doesn't know what's going on Questions? Anybody still want to talk to me after this? Rachel? Did you go to Spain? Well, you, did you go to Spain at any point when you were writing? Do you want me to go to the microphone? No, just take your mask down so I can hear you. <laughs> did you go to Spain at any point no. when you were writing this? I was in Akko. <laughs> because Malaga is just a really cool place. I mean, yeah, it, And Andalusia is it, just beautiful. I'm, right now, I'm looking at a month-long trip to Barcelona and then meeting some friends up to do the south of Spain, which would be really ideal. But no, I wasn't. I actually was in Akko, and I was walking in the same areas where Batsheva had been. And I was in um, Svat and Tiberias, which are, I think Svat is out of the book now, but in the places where um, they were. And I was in those places, and that was great. I mean, because the woman that works with me on my website lives in Herzliya. Some of you know her, Jen, <laughs> Jen Toger. And so when I go to Israel, I stay with Jen and Ellie. And so she had a list of places I needed to see for the book. <laughs> so that was really cool. I had been trying to get, I've been trying to get to Barcelona for two, and Spain for two years now, and it's been canceled because of COVID. 
So the, uh, the plan was to have been to Spain already by the time the book well, came out. You have to go to Granada because that means pomegranate. That's yeah, that's why she calls it Granadita. Yeah, and, yeah. and the, the, um, the Jews gave the, the Muslims permission to build La Alhambra. Alhambra, mm hmm. Yeah, it's, there's tons of stuff that I want to see, and I'm, I'm very familiar with with the area, you know, with all of Al-Andalus because of the research and everything else. But the intent was to be there until the pandemic started. So that's something I really, I really want to do on, you know, at a, at a different point is to go down there. But my friend Joni, who actually lived there, is thinking that if I do the Barcelona thing for a month, she'll meet me in Madrid and we'll go to the south together. So I think that would be really fun to do. Questions? More books to sign? There's food in the back. <laughs> There's, yep, the there were refreshments in the back. Thank you all for coming. This, is, this, has, been, this has been surreal. I think I'll sleep tonight for the first time in two weeks. <laughs> brought me pomegranates. Yes. Oh. I'm gonna buy another one and send it to my mom. Oh, yes, yes, I know.